<laughs> By now, we all must have seen uh, the news that broke yesterday regarding a uh, friend of the show, Katie Valenzuela's uh, pick for chief of staff. Um, is there anyone here who has not, uh, who is not aware of who this is? I feel like I might have heard of her. Yeah. Oh, I'm not, I have no clue who that, I'm sure I've never met, talked to, or am unfamiliar with this person. So right. Skylar, please tell me who it is. Flo, you are going to be over the moon when I tell you that the the person coming in to be uh, uh, Councilwoman Valenzuela's chief of staff is in fact another friend of the show, Michelle Parasat, who's been on the show a couple of times. hey what? <laughs> <laughs> So that is a big congrats to uh, Michelle mm -hmm. and and also to uh, Katie. This I'm I'm like really excited about this. Truly, like over the moon for real. Mm -hmm. Like and it's it's at a cool time too. Because I mean, oftentimes, and I know this is like a ton of pressure to to put on Katie, and I feel bad because I feel like I always do this. But like, like on Super Tuesday. Katie's race was like this light in this otherwise like black void of darkness, right? And now in the same week that like Joe Biden is just stuffing his cabinet full of like the most corrupt fucking Near corporate shit heels that the Democratic Party has to offer, fucking here's Katie uh, not or, uh, bringing uh, Michelle onto her. on Like, I just feel like every time like something terrible is happening nationally, Katie is successfully countering it by doing something wonderful locally. And I love it. I'm over the moon for it. For, for listeners who don't know the background, Michelle really is the reason that 44,000 people in Sacramento, uh, their signatures were uh, respected. And we had real rent control on the ballot this year. Uh, there was a backroom deal uh, with two of the signatories uh, agreeing to to do go with what the city decided to do, and Michelle said, "You know what? No, we're gonna we're gonna go through with this. We're gonna let the voters decide." Um, so she's a really exciting person. Uh, I'm just super happy that she would uh, that Katie would would consider her, especially after Gil Duran, the uh, editorial. Uh, I guess the opinion editor at the B uh, repeatedly referred to Michelle as bad faith uh, when I think we can point to multiple instances in which Daryl, others at City Hall and Gil himself have acted in bad faith. So again, I just think this is super exciting. Yeah, I'm pumped about it. It does beg the question though, between one and I don't know what that, I don't know what the high number here would be, 10. How many like shit ass editorials is Gil Duran about to fire off? Um, mm. Like what? Like what are we? What? What are? Where are the odds at? What do you guys think? I I, I don't know, but at this point, I think Gil is probably so angry and frustrated that. It, it, he, there may be none like <laughs> just like i mean it could be like a total wild guy like he's just so overwhelmed by it it I was i mean i right. think he probably this has probably cut into the celebration he's still having that uh sacramento's renters were defeated uh with measure c so he's probably i mean he's he's probably still finishing up those drinks and this has got to make that last sip uh a little less sweet he, he does this thing that whenever he has a political win, he takes on this fake stoicism and he goes, the people of Sacramento have decided. <laughs> and whenever there's a loss and then when Gil loses, he just ignores it. He's like, I won't write about that. So that's kind of, I think Flo's right. That's the direction it's gonna go. Yeah. I'm, um, really, I'm really like, I, I'm still struggling with this idea that bad faith is going against a backroom deal but bad faith is not being the former senate pro tem who's clearly understanding how a ballot measure works and goes around town promising everybody that this second half cent is going to be spent on everything when there's no real intention of making that promise come true. And that 
almost immediately it gets dropped down to 80% of the second half cent. And then it ends up being like $6 million, right? Like I just, I, and that's, that's the measure you promised. Like, I just don't understand how bad faith is only when you side with the people, but it's not when you side with, you know, major moneyed interests against the people. And so I'm really having a difficult time understanding why we only see bad faith in one direction, but not the other. And why mm. it's not just changing mm. your mind when you realize, gosh, that's probably not a good idea or gosh, I don't agree with this or whatever the case may be, because there are five different accounts of what happened, but all of them end up with, I think, making a decision that's in the interest of the people. And I don't care if you change your mind. That's the kind of leadership I want to see in people. If you make an agreement and you realize, wow, that's not in the interest of the people, you you go back on it because it's not cool. <laughs> like I, especially when no no like legal documents have been signed. I just I just need that to be on the record that like this idea of bad faith is really messed up if we have to commit ourselves to ideas that are harmful and inequitable um, and unjust. Right, I totally agree. I think that the way that Democrat politics work in this town has always been where you do shitty things in the back room and then you go out and face the public and you put on this face, you have this quote, shall we say decorum, and you know that's the way things have always been done but we have real principled people walking into the city hall now Hell and yeah. it doesn't matter if daryl and others up at, at the dais you know try and put on this sort of like you know this front of like well this is the way that things are conducted and and that uh, Gil over at the B is is you know accusing people of bad faith because you know we we now have the power to to change the discourse and not let them set an agenda and refer to to folks to the left of them as crazy so much. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to we we've, we've had a lot of mod friends saying well they're not going to get anything done you know who can trust Michelle? I mean it's up to you to trust Michelle. I I, I know people in just about every office in City Hall who I don't consider trustworthy. Um, and yet they still, you know, uh, work on things such as, you know, fixing a road here or there or putting a bike lane in. So um, I hope that they have and they uh, plan to put forward some good faith effort to work with Katie on the vision that she has for her uh, district and the city. Yeah. Guys, both of those, both of what you just had to say was incredibly eloquent. Um, I don't think, I don't think it can be topped. I think we should start this episode up. Is everybody Perfect down? Takes. It's only downhill from here. I, I, like, I have takes. one more thing to add. Um, Gil, eat a dick. Boy said the things they said. Boy said some from those days. All the voices heard. Hello, everyone. You have Kempa. And Skylar. And Shannon. And Flo. Yay! And we have a very special guest today in Sacramento's very own David Roddy. Uh, David has been a member of the Democratic Socialists of America for, uh, I, I think, well over a decade now. Uh, that's how I met you when I uh, joined briefly about five years ago. Um, but we're so excited to have you on. How are you doing today, Dave? Oh, I'm, I'm doing all right. Is it confusing if I call him you Dave? Like, because I'm Dave. Yeah, it is a little. <laughs> I've been confused a couple of times. Okay, um, so you're going to be David and I'm going to be Dave or Kempa. Does that, are we all? Yeah, this sounds good. Okay, yep, man. Two names. Now all right, we, America. Now we'll, that's we'll how be we able to doing. navigate this episode now. Yeah. Okay, sure, we're that's ready. been my biggest concern today. <laughs> uh, but no, we're... We, we got you on today and I'm, I'm super excited about it uh, because we wanted to talk with you about, uh, a, I believe he's a childhood friend of yours, um, mm -hmm. Michael Israel. 
um, who, if, if anybody in Sacramento in our region uh, has been in leftist circles, in organizing circles, they know him well and they, they know about sort of uh, his, his life story. Um, just to give a little background to folks, Michael Israel has been a longtime activist, labor organizer here. He was a part of Occupy Sacramento. He was part of SCIU, I believe, briefly, uh, but he's worked in labor organizing kind of throughout the region and even up in the foothills. Uh, and then he also ended up going out and fighting uh, in the Kurdish revolution in Northeastern Syria. And uh, on his second tour, he passed there almost exactly four years ago. Um, does that, is that a pretty good, uh, recap is there anything that any more cliff notes we should give be before we dive into this today uh no i think that's probably fine okay um so let's just to begin you know i think he is a really interesting character to me first of all i never got to meet him uh which is uh the more i read about him the more i really regret that uh but he is sort of turning into in my opinion um, this, this, this kind of interesting, beautiful Star Wars figure uh, in, in leftist organizing in a time when it was, you know, it's, it had been sort of stagnant for the last 90 years. And he was a part of this, this re rejuvenation, this spark. Um, and I want to start by beginning with I guess just as early as we can get. Um, I, I believe you two were pretty young when you met. You were growing up kind of around the same age in the same place. So just start there. Uh, how did you meet Dave? Or uh, sorry, Michael. And uh, where where did your your obsession? Because I know you you are a very much a, a sort of encyclopedic resource on on leftist uh, movements in history here in the U.S. too. Where did this obsession and interest come from for you two? And kind of where did that lead you to starting with where you met? So we met um, when we were both in the eighth grade, which must have been. Oh, geez. I can't remember what year that would have been. <laughs> but, Don't do it um, to yourself, man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. A, a long time ago. <laughs> um, and he and I both were kind of bookish. He was much more shy than I was, but we both were very interested in history and in politics. And, um, you know, I mean, we kind of had the basic sort of understanding of what had happened at the um, Battle of Seattle in 1999, you know, the, like the anti-globalization movement, which was really the main current of the left at that time. And we'd read Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky. And, you know, so like we were kind of just like high school neophyte leftists together, I would say. I do remember at one point, I believe he tried to organize a student union um, at the high school. So like he was very conscious of it. And this was a high school in Jackson, right? Right. Well, it was it was this wacky little charter school that like all these sort of like hippie arty kids went to in um in Pine Grove, which is maybe ten minutes east of Jackson by the casino. Okay, so the casino. So organizing students isn't that out of the ordinary in sort of a hippie school like that. I mean. It still is pretty I, out of the ordinary. I, I think it was pretty weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so after I graduated, like after I graduated high school, I kind of didn't talk to him for maybe a year. I became very disappointed with Obama. And so in 2010, I kind of reached out to him again. And we started talking at the Denny's in Jackson like, every couple of days. And Skylar knows a lot about Denny's. Let's <laughs> <laughs> not get let's not get derailed here. Okay, okay. Yeah, at some point he also tried to organize the Denny's workers. Like he was just like a very bizarre, just like like organizing machine. Amazing. Um but so we were we would get together and we would talk about local politics and we tried to get a other people who were sort of like left of center in Amador County together in a group that we called um, Motherload Progressives. And we had a blog for a little while. And it was really just me and him trying to get some of these older, like kind of hippie-ish 
Democratic Party types to, um, I don't know, talk about Marxism or whatever. And so that really was our relationship going into um, Occupy. And so when Occupy happened, Michael was involved. That was the fall of 2011. It was the fall of 2011, yeah. And Michael was involved initially in Occupy Sacramento and was arrested two or three times. And he was really trying to do like an Occupy the Foothills thing, which we were both kind of like trying to um, organize around. We'd also previously, I mean, people like Occupy seems to be like in a lot of people's minds, like kind of the start of like the new, new left, but really um, the 2011 uprising in Wisconsin was like the first real movement that was addressing class inequality in society. And so we had organized people mm-hmm. to go up from Amateur County to Sacramento. And so we kind of developed this relationship with Sacramento and the foothills. That's cool. So, yeah. So early on, yeah, just uh, Madison, Wisconsin, that was right. the start in the U.S. And Madison was actually happening around the same time as Tahir Square in Cairo in Egypt. And they were actually in pretty close contact, too. Um, so yeah, we did a solidarity rally, actually, in Setter Creek. I don't know if people know where Setter Creek is, but it's just like a little... It's just a little foothill town. We did a pro, a pro Wisconsin anti Scott Walker protest there, um, and so it's we were so just, funny to hear as a Wisconsinite. It's just so funny to hear stuff like this from folks yeah. in California. <laughs> so keep going. I'm sorry. And so I was in, I, I had graduated um, or not graduated, but I had enrolled at UC Davis, and so I my first year at UC Davis was when all those you know kids were pepper sprayed. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was back in Amateur County trying to start help Michael do like his Occupy the Foothills business. And and so he would come to Davis sometimes for Occupy UC Davis stuff. Um, And he kind of developed a a cynical view of middle class students, which I also shared. And I think that that January we did this thing in Ione, which is where I'm, where I grew up. The town is, it's west of Jackson. We did a small town punks against rural poverty, and we did like a benefit show for um, the local community action agency that was kind of on the front lines of the homelessness crisis and the uh, unemployment crisis, which was particularly bad in rural California following the recession. Were were you in punk bands, you and him? Uh, I would try to get into punk bands, but it was just me. And he would like, (laughs) like he would just kind of do the groundwork. Like that was kind of a, we had this relationship where like I kind of had these ideas and he'd do all the groundwork and then we'd like kind of put them together. And so we had this, um, I was always kind of the public face of things in some sense, at least maybe, maybe it's just cause you know, it's from my perspective, but I always felt that he was more in the background kind of like doing the actual work. Um, can, can you, I, I don't think we've, we've given listeners enough on like who he was as a friend in your early, you know, twenties, late teens, what kind of person is this guy who's trying to organize his high school and, and and organize a Denny's and who, uh, you know, unapologetically goes into deep red California to, to talk to workers and, and try and, and get them to consider, you know, uh, solidarity and empowerment. Who, who is this person uh, that is doing this in like the early 2000s? Well, I mean, the region I guess 2011. has a lot of poverty and I think one thing that we both kind of bonded over is how the poverty that we either experienced or witnessed growing up really disturbed us. And I would say he was kind of like a puckish character, like kind of like a trickster. Um, and definitely like an online troll. I remember he had like multiple Facebook accounts of just different people that he had <laughs> made up in his head. Um, and so <laughs> I think that that sort of like trickster archetype um, kind of goes through his life story and um, and so he, I think he developed a real interest in sort of 
tricking, you know, the, um, the bosses, so to speak. And, oh, one thing I forgot to mention is when we were graduating high school, he actually walked across the country to protest the Iraq war. Mm. And that was something I really regretted not joining him doing. Um, and it was him and one other young woman, right? Yeah. This woman, I think her name was Ashley and they, they had other people who had joined them off and on, but yeah, just walked across the country to protest the Iraq war. And, you know, they got on, you know, they definitely had like a democracy now coverage, but they got on like Fox news and some stuff that was kind of fun, but he came back from that very depressed. Um, And I think that's something that I experienced with him off and on was just his sort of disillusionment with um, the social realities that we face, which I think ultimately is what probably led to his death. Well, 2007 was when he did this walk, right? And that's right. Yeah. This was four years after, give or take, uh, the start of the Iraq war when we're, we were kind of in this nadir where the left felt powerless. You know, you went out and marched against this war, it didn't fucking matter. And yeah. then it's four years before Occupy. And so, uh, you know, you don't really see much on the horizon. You don't see much bubbling up. Um, so, yeah, that's a tough time. And it, it's, I guess, I, and sorry for just jumping in and interjecting here, but it just seems remarkable that a person in 2007 would do such, such an amazing taxing, sacrificing thing like that in a time when it felt like nobody cared and no one was listening yeah i think you know he had a lot of heroes um like he definitely admired the old martyrs of the industrial workers of the world and kind of had these figures that he saw kind of giving themselves over to this higher cause Uh, one thing that's interesting to note about michael is he was quite christian very much so in high school, but even in when I knew him as an adult, like, you know, you still always had a Bible on him um, and you'd use the Bible as um, a source to sort of justify his like socialism. And so I think he had have had this ideal of like doing all that he could to help the people around him to give life meaning. Um, and I think that's something that he genuinely believed. Yeah, it seems from what I read about him, because I also uh, never uh, had, a, had a chance to meet him, but I, it sounds like he was like, bas- like more or less uncontrollably compelled to right any wrong that he came across. I mean, it, he seems like the kind of person who couldn't walk away from people who needed him if he could help them at all. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's very... Uh, so, for example, um, when his body came back, there was sort of like it became a funeral. It wasn't really supposed to be a funeral. Um, he had multiple funerals, which is something that I think everybody should aspire to. Um, but, you know, all these people came up and t- talked about how he'd spend like all hours of the night, you know, talking with them through like whatever their problems were on Facebook. And I was just like, God, like this guy should have been asleep, you know, like he i think he took this compulsion for sex self-sacrifice almost to a, an extent where it was wearing down on his body and his mind um and so yeah there's definitely like a, a dark side to it too um that's kind of hard to put your finger because i think we really want to like idealize people but it's not like wanting to help everybody all the time can ultimately i destroy you as an individual i think um and so i think it was you know it was his greatest strength that's why we're talking about him today but it was also like a weakness and something that i felt mildly annoyed as a friend so for example like if he had a problem he'd try to be very stoic about it and so i'd always have to kind of start talking about my problems first and then he would kind of like use that as like a means to um jump off and like kind of like relate to me by talking about his problems and that's how he kind of got him to talk about what was going on inside of him and so so you you used his empathy against him to get him to open up (laughs) yeah 
um that was it was a that was just like the trick that i figured out um but yeah so i think he's mostly remembered as somebody who's just like this sort of like figure of empathy and i don't think it's wrong i also think that it um is what killed him can we can we continue leading up to to him going off to 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 fight in syria uh uh, we discussed Occupy, um, and then uh, I believe uh, all of you were building up um, DSA here locally, the, the Democratic Socialists of America, um, to keep us down that path. Right. And so after Occupy, he and I and um, Andy Sunderland and some of the people from um, the UC Davis chapter of the Young Democratic Socialists that I started began a chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America here. And there was a DSA chapter here that had existed from um, in some way or another for like, you know, several decades, but it really was, you know, just one older socialist holding the flame. And so you're going to organize this group of young people to kind of take the organization and try to build something new with it. And so at the time there were several active YDSA chapters or what was YDS then, Young Democratic Socialists. But the Democratic Socialists of America, like the adult um, non-student organization, really only existed um, in Philadelphia with um, kids who graduated there going on to like kind of do the same thing and in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And so Michael was really kind of on the ground floor of DSA um, building up to what it eventually would become in after the election of Donald Trump and all of a sudden, you know, you have a chapter in every city. Yeah, we've got 85,000 members today. Uh, it's it's something, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, and, and you know, he, he died right before, like, like literally right before that happened. And so it's very kind of bittersweet to see, you know, I don't know, like, a hundred red flags and a parade somewhere and just be like, Oh, you know, this is something that was in your dreams that you would never see um, alive um, in the United States, at least, obviously I'm sure yeah. there's many a red flag parade in Rojava. Um, and so he, I think he just became very disillusioned um, with the left in general, like even even though like we had kind of a group of like maybe like five people, which was kind of a big deal um, to have five committed socialists that had given place at the time. Like it wasn't really a, a left, so to speak. And certainly was an organization of, you know, hundreds of people that exist in Sacramento today. And so when Assad pulled out of Northeastern Syria there was um that's this... for listeners that's bashar al-assad and uh sort of the i guess you'd call him what like the dictator of syria yeah and he left this political vacuum where the kurds who had traditionally been under this kurdistan workers party the pkk um and it had kind of transformed into this different party structure where it was much less centralized and their main leader, Abdullah, Abdullah Achlan, who is sort of like their, there's a cult of personality around him. He was imprisoned by the Turkish government. And so when, while in prison, he became very influenced by like uh, American anarchists like Murray Bookchin. And this is kind of after the fall of the Soviet Union. And so he's kind of giving up on the, traditional Marxist Leninist party form that he had kind of built around Turkey. And so this idea that he called democratic confederalism, which was this sort of like mix of like traditional Kurdish beliefs, as well as um, his interpretations of democracy and socialism and feminism and ecology and the also influenced by just, you know, the general, guerrilla movement that held on to these socialist ideals, they began to actually take power um, in northern Syria or northeastern Syria, and they called it uh, Rojava, and that was kind of just like um, 
the um it was an autonomous territory right so they weren't really trying to create a state but they were trying to create a an area where this experiment of democratic confederalism could kind of blossom and so they had um a militia the people's protection units and the women's protection units the ypg and ypj and, and i think i think there's actually a show on hulu now about the ypj which i, I didn't watch um and that was the women's protection unit yeah um and so there there's two there's two militias that kind of work side by side and so like within sort of the democratic confederalist thought like there had to be a man and a woman at every post and so like every government position had to have a man and a woman and so, I mean, this is, mind you, this is a very patriarchal society. They're still trying to fight against mm-hmm. female circumcision. And so they're, it's, they're very much pushing like this sort of, um, this sort of radical feminism into, um, into the daily civic life of the inhabitants of this region. And they were then the main targets of ISIS and yeah. they kind of saw ISIS as this fascistic threat. And so they made a call out to the, you know, the world for people to come join them. And initially um, a lot of people that were kind of like wacko commando types um, went to Rojava and, you know, to fight the Muslim hordes or whatever, not really realizing that they were going to be fighting alongside essentially like Muslim communists. Right. And, uh, and so can I drive home for listeners, just like everything you've just been describing. So this is a region in Northeastern Syria that this really profoundly interesting and, and, and I guess you could call it a radical movement has begun where it's feminist, uh, it's somewhat monetarily egalitarian where, you know, everybody's needs, you know, as best you can in a place that's so war-torn uh, are, are, are going to be met. And then also it's uh, very much eco-driven, like it's, it's very much concerned with the environment and the fact that, you know, uh, if the environment crashes, like we're all done for, not only are they creating this amazing sort of culture, community, dynamic uh, governance system, they are being attacked by Bashar al-Assad from the, the Southwest, who has, you know, we've seen it in the news, he used chemical warfare against civilians, um, just like deeply disturbing stuff and very much not a, a not just a, a, a very uh, brutal enemy to be fighting against. Uh, they also are fighting against, as you just said, ISIS, um, which they are, they border with Iraq. And so ISIS is building out their sort of little space in that area. And then, and, and I think you'll get to this, uh, also Turkey is suddenly, um, you know, uh, being a, a belligerent against the people up in this region too. Um, so I just wanted to drive home all of that to people, kind of what this looked like and where they were and, and what this, yeah, so keep going, sorry. Yeah, and so it, I think it's important to also to point out that Turkey was very much allowing ISIS to cross over their borders um, on supply runs. Michael would say when, you know, they had, um, you know, killed um, ISIS militants, they would find them with like, just like Turkish gear. Um, And so Turkey was also kind of fighting its own proxy war against the Kurds. And they, um, up to this day, have a very um, strongly right-wing nationalist government that's very anti-Kurd. Right. Um, As well as being like, very anti-socialist, anti um, any sort of social progressivism, and so. So what what yeah, brought so, Michael out there? So I think that Michael was really inspired by this idea of the um, international battalions of the Spanish Civil War, and this idea that like maybe if there's a revolution happening, like it's the responsibility of an able-bodied 
radical to go and support it. And I think it was really that. I think, you know, he was working very hard as a shop steward for SEIU. He was doing a lot of long hours and he was also becoming very um, frustrated with the bureaucracy within the trade union movement. And I think just generally disillusioned with the, the left in the United States. And um, so we did our community action agency, agency fundraiser. And then like we were attacked by the Jackson city council and they try to like send all the money. We got these punk kids to give us back. And so we had like this ongoing relationship then with the community action agency. And I eventually just got like a check that I burned. But um, after that in um, November, oh, August of 2012, there was a strike at the Sierra Pine and Pine like particle boards um, factory in Jackson. And Michael and I went up there kind of like, we went to the picket line and we were just like, how can we, how can we help? And there's like, Oh, what the hell are these, you know, these kids doing up here? Like, are, are they spies? Um, and so we eventually um, developed a close relationship with the, um, one of the union leaders there who became very close with Michael and we would organize um, sort of like community solidarity events along the picket line and we also set up a Facebook page called Support Amateur Workers. So we just kind of like try to counter the narratives that were coming out of like the Sacramento Bee against the strikers and also just against like, you know, random like redneck fascists on Facebook. And then in November in 2012, Rayleigh's went on strike and the so Michael and then this um, fellow who was um the organizer for the Sama workers went out there and to support their picket line. And so we did kind of the same thing. And eventually we eventually organized a march from downtown Jackson up to the Rayleigh's picket line with people who had been on strike at the Ampine factory. And you have to imagine this is a small town. So people are kind of, um, people are kind of, you know, people whose husbands worked at the factory, they work at the Rayleigh's. And so there's a very close relationship. And then in Placerville at that time, the, our Walmart, which was kind of a alt labor group that the UFCW was um, organizing. And, and so there's a picket line of Walmart workers that went out. And so Michael and I went and we spent a, long, a lot of time with Walmart workers and then Michael was arrested. I think I was arrested twice. Maybe he was arrested three times um, at various actions, direct actions in support of Walmart workers. And so there was this kind of, um, after Occupy, there was this sort of feeling in the air with you know these low wage service sector workers and these factory workers in Jackson that maybe there was the potential to organize something but it kind of just that's all... really cool because we didn't have that in new york uh after after bloomberg crushed us and and shoot us out of zuccotti we we had nothing like that so it's interesting to hear that out here yeah and you know a lot of the people that were hired onto these like that just became sort of um staff for these alt labor campaigns were kids that you know were in occupy at their colleges which I think at one it speaks to the sort of bureaucratic top-down nature of some of these protests. Excuse me, but um. So can it also you walk speaks... us closer? And I'm sorry, we. Okay, I just yeah. want to be uh, cognizant of time. So, okay, so sorry. walk us through the years uh, up until you know his friendship with with Delmer Berg and and Berg being, of course, the the last living um, uh, veteran from the Spanish Civil War. Yeah. So. He, I mean, he met Delmar Berg and was very inspired by him. And so I think all these factors coming together is what really led him to go and fight in Syria. Um, and I think that, you know, he saw it as sort of a... having some kind of continuity with international brigades in the past that have supported various like revolutionary struggles and 
I think he felt that the time that he had on earth, like this is where, this is where revolution was happening. And this is where he should put his livelihood and time. Um, yeah. Yeah. So a place where he could really make a difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and so for listeners, uh, I, I'd I'd recommend also listening to our, our recently, uh, unlocked episode on the Spanish civil war and the American Lincoln brigade. Basically, this was the war in 1936 through 1939 in Spain that was between the fascists and the people who just were against fascism. It was it was a broad front of communists, socialists. Uh, there were some anarchists, and there were even just some, I guess today we might call them libs, but these were people who were pro-democracy fighting against fascism. Uh, and and this was one of those things that brought in a lot of people from different countries, 3000 Americans, um, many of them leftists against our government's uh, orders uh, snuck into Spain to fight against the fascists out there. So it's, this is a war that I think a lot of us on the left really kind of um, we look to and we think about when we think about, you know, how, how do we uh, take our struggles and, and, and make them a reality? Uh, so, sorry, I, I just wanted to give some context to that, David. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. And so, so he, he, he goes out there. Yeah. Yeah. And at the time, you know, there wasn't really any sort of ideological um, vetting of people. And so you have people that were very far right wing go out there and there's one story of him while they're being they're crossing the border into Iraq and Syria and they end up like being alongside a neo-Nazi and like was well, like this guy can't be like this guy can't be in fighting alongside of me. And they actually just like kicked the Nazi out. And then as kind of the year progressed. So was this like a Nazi that was like I'm that was just like, here oh, to I'm fight f- Muslims? Exactly. Oh exactly. my god. Um and so they established like sort of training schools for the international brigades. And um, I just remember one story, like Michael really didn't like the other Americans on his first like visit. And so he ended up befriending a, uh, an anarchist from Iran and they got into a debate about Judith Butler, just like in this little like encampment. I don't remember the, uh, just like kind of a bizarre story of like these two people just arguing about Judith Butler, like in like um a, you know, a little like mud, like building. And, um, and so the time when he went back after his first, I guess, tour, the people that were fighting alongside him were much more ideologically driven. And so there wasn't really like this, um, weird sort of like reactionary, um, racist element within the, um, the the YPG's international um, support. But I think one thing that really is important to think about um, is because he felt so alienated from the other Westerners, he was really quick to learn Kurdish and befriend the Kurds who were much more like kind of thinking along the same lines that he was. And so he became very beloved because he felt such a need to reach out to the Kurdish people. And I also think because he felt so alienated from the other, the Westerners there. And so I think that kind of part of the reason why his death has become kind of so um, taken up as such like an example of like martyrdom for the Kurds um, in the United States is because in Rojava, he developed this really close relationship. And when he came back um, to California, he met with the Kurdish community here and really developed a close relationship with them. And so like he was really trying to bring together his own history as a labor organizer um, and as a radical with the fight against um, like reactionary politics in the East to the Kurdish community here and kind of trying to bring all these links together. And I think that's kind of what makes the story so special. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I remember. So Scott Thomas and Anderson, a reporter uh, at the, the News and Review, wrote a really beautiful uh, piece soon after Mike, Michael passed, um, discussing his life and his death. And he talked a, a bit about how how Michael used to go to the the Kurdish Cultural Center and just like you know spend time with folks and get get to know them um, between his two tours, um, and then he also wrote about how when his body was flown back to the U.S., uh, there were folks there were Kurds who came uh, for the 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 funeral procession, right? I mean, people will sell his face on T-shirts as somebody who like was like friends with somebody who definitely is somebody that get fought with him is kind of flawed like it's very bizarre to see him become kind of kind of a a mythological figure like a martyr by definition can't be a living person right and so his life after death is very bizarre from somebody he knew him while he was alive but i think that's kind of like you know what he's transformed into um for you, is that a good thing, uh, or or is it not? Can you not look at it through that binary? As a friend who met him in eighth grade, yeah, I mean, I think that it it feels weird for me to see like just this you know this guy's face become like a symbol of hope and resistance to you know the Kurds in California um who certainly I had no organic connection to and so it's a on one hand it is inspiring but on the other hand you know he wasn't always the best person you know he was a human being we fought and um and so part of him is kind of erased in a sense and so i I don't know i don't know how i feel about it it's something i really struggle with i i'm i'm really interested in this because i think the way that the the article we read you know just to kind of prepare for this um in the news and review it ended with something that really stuck stood out to me as something that i wanted to ask you about it was sort of this I mean, you, you were talking about martyrdom and it, w- it was kind of ending with this idea that like, you know, he never got enough rest. He extended himself to everyone um, that, you know, there's a piece of him that was just kind of missing in, in that piece. And I think, you know, what you're alluding to here is that he's kind of become otherworldly and not this human being that had flaws and one of the things that we might admire about him is also a thing that you know maybe he struggled with which was overextending himself and you know and not taking the time to be able to you know spend time with with you know his family the way that he wanted to and with his friends and right and like all this like complicated truth that I think sometimes goes away when we only look at people through the lens of being like our heroes and so I'm I'm really curious you know to know more from you you know David about like what you know what are your feelings about that and how do you how do you see him and what would you what would you want our listeners to walk away knowing about him given your relationship with him and given that he's not this otherworldly figure for you he is your friend um, and he is a, a real human being who you touched and spoke to and fought with and smelled his, you know, stinky breath in the morning when you had sleepovers. <laughs> like, like, what would you want us to know about him or how would you want us to honor him? Well, I think that um, one thing that is really admirable um, is his commitment to international solidarity and I think there is a tendency within our culture um, to really worry about positions of, or, or people's positionalities, right? Um, and I certainly feel that way when I'm in these Kurdish community spaces and I'm just like, okay, I'm just like this kind of like awkward white, like English speaker. Um, 
And I think that he, by whatever reason, kind of was able to kind of put that aside and really throw himself into a struggle that he saw was linked to the struggle of all humans to reach their freedom. And I think that, I think that notion is very admirable. And also the notion of solidarity amongst workers, like he really went out of his way to talk to people who might hold viewpoints that are reprehensible, but like he can find a common ground with, with them enough to like go out on a strike or um, go on a picket line. And when he came back, there was a, a county supervisor in Calaveras County who had talked about um, Mexicans as an invasive species. And so he went and he spoke alongside like members of the Chicana community um, against like this racist supervisor. And so like he really kind of devoted his life to not just anti-racial struggle, but like a, a struggle of that's based on the understanding of solidarity. Um, I also think that, you know, people like him kind of do reach this otherworldly status um, in part because his life just wasn't sustainable the way he was leaving it like you know just giving and giving and giving um and and yeah and so I, I don't really know i mean a lot of people really admire him i mean i admire him of course but i also think that people should you know be aware of their own feelings and be able to articulate them with other people and i think that you know that's probably a lesson of his life that people aren't going to hear about because it kind of, I don't want to say tarnishes a reputation, but kind of speaks to the sort of damage that his like kind of compulsive altruism did to his own body and mind. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Totally makes sense. Yeah. You know, but it, it, it is, you're, you're totally right. It's, especially when you know we we can start considering somebody a martyr and 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 somewhat deifying them right uh having shiny pictures of their face on our shirts and our and stuff um but i think i especially in in leftist spaces or in in advocacy spaces you see people that are really burning the candle at both ends and you are concerned for them. And maybe there is something, I guess, to, to carry on and to take from that and to, you know, um, bring to their attention. I don't, I don't, I have no articulate way of putting this. I'm sorry. Yeah. And then on the other hand, maybe, I mean, there was a bit that he wrote, um, from his first tour in these diaries that I mean, I, I want to have transcribed, but I'm also afraid to look at them um, where there's, there's this section where he's, you know, being shelled. And he's like, I cannot be Sahid and Sahid is like the word for martyr. And so they have like this phrase martyrs never die. And so it's kind of like martyrdom becomes kind of a part of a culture. I think of any oppressed group that faces really severe lethal repression from um the state and so he's just writing to himself that he cannot let himself die like like being a dead revolutionary is really no good and i think you know he was right and so when i read that it just you know gutted me because it's like well you know like, um that's exactly what happened but um yeah i mean being being a living revolutionary i think is more helpful to the world than being a dead one um but yeah i don't know it's it's complicated um yeah. and i don't have i don't think i've really worked through all my emotions about it and probably never will no um and like i i appreciate you just even discussing it with us on this level because I'm, I'm sure it's got to be, it's got to feel very complex, right? Uh, with all the, the fights that are happening today. Um, I, my, I had a question that Flo kind of already kind of touched on it, but, but maybe if I ask it in a, a slightly different way, um, it's, it's, it might yield a somewhat different answer. 
Um, when someone passes who I cared about or who I deeply respected, my big question to myself is which of their qualities can I put into the world to kind of help them live on? How would you answer that for Michael Israel uh, for a leftist in Sacramento and in California and, and I guess in, in the world because he was an international solidarity guy? Yeah, no, and people like people know about him, you know, all over the place. Like, I, you know, I talked to people about him like in Ireland, but I think that one thing that we've done is before COVID, so for the first thing three years not including this year every may we'd have um a event where we try to bring in different speakers and musicians to talk about revolutionary struggles in different parts of the world and the last event that we had it we had at cafe colonial um the year before this covid year so may 2019 and you know we had like punk and ska bands uh, you know on one stage and the other stage we had people coming and talking about revolutionary movements in turkey and the philippines in brazil um the movement for trans rights here and kind of like trying to tie together um different revolutionary struggles um in the world in a way at least that people can wrap their minds around and so you know like having all these punk kids you know these hipsters just come and like listen to some old like turkish revolutionary socialist i think is like uh i mean i i think that's a good way to honor his memory um and i really think that going forward like just realizing that these struggles are international in scope and you know we do live in a global capitalist system and the systems of like racial and gender oppression that um kind of lubricated are international in scope and so i think that if anything if any if there's any lesson of his life that i think people should know it's to not limit yourself to you know a single, you know, picket line, so to speak, but really start thinking about how your struggles are part of a global struggle for human emancipation and try to articulate that politically. And that should be, you know, a political project that, that, that is the political project of the left. Right. Um, and so I think that that is one thing that his death really did was bring people together in a way that they might not have otherwise um, had the chance to. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. I think it does. Um, Did we, I feel like we kind of left off of more or less like his story without really getting to the, the end. Um, he comes, cause he comes so he goes over and he does like six months or something over in Rojava, yeah? And then mm -hmm. he comes back. You saw him during this period, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Like, who, what was he like as compared to the version of him that you knew who left? Well, I mean, I really encouraged him to kind of talk to me about like his nightmares I was worried about the development of PTSD, but just in terms of general mental health, like I would say he kind of left very frazzled and he came back with a real state of peace. And I think that he saw a revolutionary society that, you know, kind of inspired him that there could be a future for humans where we can live um, without, um, just horrific exploitation and so i think it, he, he seemed very peaceful and it was very clear that he would die there i think his vision of dying there would be as like um just like an old sheep farmer you know um 
settling down with some Kurdish woman and just living the rest of his life in like this um new like communitarian society. But but yeah, he seemed very at peace. I mean, he still had nightmares. I mean, it's a horrible horrible war, as we all know. But I think that it really gave him a sense of hope that he didn't have in the United States. Well, and then that's compounded, right, by like what, just so we have sort of a picture. So he, what is happening to the America that he comes back to after going to this place and like oh. getting this completely new scope? He comes back and what's happening here? There's, you know, like he and I are at like a, well, we're not at a neo-Nazi rally as neo Nazi, obviously like but like there's neo-nazis rally in sacramento and industry that was the like, capital sort of melee yeah. uh yeah, four June. and a half years ago yeah 2015, yeah 2016. 2016 yeah yeah 2016. and so like the it was the first big trump rally in sacramento and it was held by like actual like factual neo-nazis you know not like proud boys but like people had done time in jail like, and have like goose stepping yeah roman salute nazis right yeah and um, and he and I were there kind of on the sidelines. I remember he gave me a story about how the guy from the FBI that had came and visited him, visit hit, visited him in his home after he came back was there and like sat down next to him and like took off his black block gear. Um, and um, and so, yeah, like like I don't think that he or really anybody anticipated Trump winning. I think that there was a very real sense of looming fascism. And, you know, we have, you know, fascist rallies at the Capitol every weekend now, let's be honest. But he died really right after Trump won. Um, and so, and so I, I think that he didn't really... I don't think he really anticipated America like having a government that was, you know, the sort of um, equivalent of Erdogan's government in Turkey. And I think also, you know, he also came back into like Bernie Sanders rallies. And so, and, and so I think the America that he left was very divided, but, you know, there was this hope around Bernie Sanders and DSA was kind of like, on the sidelines and you never really got to see that come into a political force with, you know, members on city council. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that he came back and saw, you know, he saw socialist rallies and he saw fascist rallies, which are things that I don't think we ever would have expected to see a year earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I just want to do uh, for my part, one last question on on legacy and and on I guess on media and media's effect on legacy. You know, when when he passed, he he died by a Turkish airstrike. Right. And the US nor any other Western, you know, quote unquote progressive uh nation has done any sort of uh, any sort of research into this, any sort of um, investigation into his his killing by the Turkish uh, Turkish airstrike. On top of that, you you and I, I I ask all of this too, kind of thinking about not just you, about his family and how they want him to be remembered, and I just. To me, it's really important that like this shit's not in vain and we don't let the narrative be set by the wrong people. Uh, and when I look at Scott's piece in the News and Review, uh, I, I keep thinking about uh, how the media treated his, his passing out there uh, at the Kurdish revolution. Uh, I'm gonna read this uh, verbatim. In the coming days, the story slowly emerged from YPG reports. Turkish fighter jets continued to target not only ISIS militants in northern Syria, but also the very Kurdish units who were beating them back. Israel, along with a German YPG volunteer, was killed in an airstrike. 
a Voice of America story classified Israel as, quote, an extremist. The 24-hour news cycle began referring to him as, quote, an anarchist rather than a democratic socialist. Journalists from national newspapers commented that his death seemed, quote, random. What, what to you uh, is important about remembering him um, in response to the narratives that we saw very briefly uh, uh, from mainstream media after he passed? Well, I think that, you know, something that I'm sure that you are actively engaged in is building a context for understanding social struggles. And part of that's building media. And so, you know, like the the media kind of like latched onto this idea of like a radical anarchist that kind of just like went on an adventure. And I mean, it couldn't really comprehend either his connections to the Kurdish community or his connections with like the labor movement in the United States. And so I think that the responsibility of, of the left um, is to, is to just offer a counter narrative. I mean, I, I don't really know anything else you can do. Like you can like make comments on, you know, voice of America's, you know, Facebook page or something, but like, I think really it comes down to us building a counter narrative of what his life meant and putting it into a broader context of what it meant for people who are working minimum wage in Jackson, um, putting it in context of people who are walking out of Walmart stores in Placerville, putting it into a context of how those people could relate to workers seizing factories and, um, you know, Syria. And so, and so I don't think, I don't think that the media could really grasp the meaning of his death because they can't really grasp the actual struggles that define our social reality. Yeah, I think that's really well put. Um, does anybody else have, have questions for David? Dave, okay. uh, Dave Kemper, I do, though, have a question for you. Oh, what's that? Um, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to skip through most of this. But basically, to the long and short of it is that I have heard of uh, heard tell of a place that I can visit online uh, has a a consolidated uh, a, a cache of uh, of perfect oh takes um and i was wondering if you would be willing to share with me and our listeners um where that is and where that can be found mm -hmm. um i've been going to to military surplus stores throughout the u.s and building out this this cache of, <laughs> of perfect takes uh and and it's it's very beautiful and uh, i welcome all of you to find it uh, it's at a place called voicesrivercity.com and it's been around for a little over three years. Uh, we've done news, we've done arts coverage, we've done the Follow the Money Project, where our current iteration is, of course, the podcast. Uh, you can find us on social media, on Twitter at Voices River City, Instagram at Voices River City. It's very funny. Skylar does that. Follow that. Uh, Facebook, Voices River City. Um, starting this month now, um, all of our Tuesday episodes are free to everyone, um, including this one. And so we're very excited about that. Uh, and then all of our Friday episodes will be patron only. So for as little as five, also, if you're already a patron, that changes nothing. You can go uh, listen or watch our episodes at our Patreon. Um, well, I mean, you can also just so listeners are aware, you can get that you can get that feed in whatever podcast format you use as well. You yes. do not need to go to patreon.com. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in some uh, podcasts, uh, you, you just have to have like basically the, the feed link and then, you know, follow the directions uh, that your podcast platform gives you. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So we are also, uh, yeah, on Patreon, 
um, as little as $5 a month, that's a beer at the bar no one's going to right now, or a hot chocolate at the coffee shop that you probably shouldn't be going to right now. Um, uh, and, and you'll get double the episodes, double the fun, uh, and we love you and we hope you continue to support us. Um, I guess before I even talk about our personal social media, David, I want to say, uh, thank you so much. Um, this has been, I, I think it's just been, it's been fascinating, of course, and, and super interesting, but also like uh emotional and uh like i just i i i have so so much respect for someone not just like michael but for someone like you uh who's been a part of these fights uh so much longer and so much longer before it was cool um i remember when i briefly joined dsa five years ago you know you were the person i met uh, along with andy and um, and I, I just, I don't think folks like you get, get as much, um, respect or acknowledgement as you deserve. So thank you for coming on. Thank you for helping us learn about Michael's, uh, journey and story. Thank you. Um, and just thanks for being you. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Um, thank you. Well, another mm -hmm. interesting thing about you, David uh, Roddy, this time is you actually have your own fantastic podcast. Do you want to plug that? Yeah. Um, so I have a podcast that I um, do with this woman, Mercedes Castillo, who is um, kind of a local punk scenester. Uh, she'd hate that. But um, it's called <laughs> Shit Gets Weird. And you can find it with the SH exclamation point t gets weird at apple podcast or spotify and it's sort of um an exploration of the cultural politics that surround the paranormal and so right now we're working an episode about mass spirit possessions in um crowded southeast asian sweatshops i've been enjoying this, this is like the, the best premise for a podcast cannot, i've ever heard of i cannot wait i'm going fantastic to subscribe. i'm gonna smash the subscribe button yeah <laughs> smash it's it so funny oh my god it, i love it i've been enjoying it um but yeah uh so oh, okay yeah uh, also yeah we're on youtube too if you want to look at our faces as well so uh <laughs> voices river city there um I guess we should say how to find us all on social personally. I am on Twitter at, you know, Kempa, why are you K-N-O-W-K-E-M-P-A? You can find me at guillotine for you. That's guillotine, the number four, Y-O-U. I am Shan N.D. Stevens. And I am Flo Jean, F-L-O-J-A-U-N-E. Now, David, can we find you? on social media and or shit gets weird uh on yeah Twitter. if you just go to shit gets weird.com spelled normal shit without the extra <laughs> shit gets weird.com um there's links to our twitter um instagram and patreon and facebook hell yeah hey real quick before we sign off um i i, I wanted to bring something up uh for our listeners uh like uh, David alluded to a little bit earlier, we are experiencing a uh, thing here in Sacramento where every Saturday afternoon, a bunch of fucking fascists drive into our town and fuck shit up. Uh, so this has been happening weekly for four weeks or something like that. Um, the they are i mean when i say fuck shit up i mean they're assaulting people they're harassing our unhoused neighbors they're beating people up uh it's it's fucking completely unacceptable and the cops are wa either watching them do it or helping them do it so there's no there is no end in sight and they do not seem to be running out of steam on their own um if you would like to be part of an effort to discourage these guys from feeling like they can just come down here and do this every week um there is a like-minded group of people who are meeting in fremont park uh that is this saturday the 5th at 10 a.m if you can get out to fremont park um it's one of those things where the more people there are uh the more of us there are the safer everybody is so if you can get out there and do it um 
it's it it's fantastic work like i said a couple of weeks ago if you can't get out and do it that's also fine too um there's groups like norcal resist that you can donate to to help uh, folks get out of jail uh for you know being just, there uh, yeah being there <laughs> you know whatever because yeah, the cops are going to um, arrest the people resisting the fascists they're not going to arrest the fascists <laughs> Right. So um, I would encourage you, though, to come in person if you are able to. Um, if you do decide to come out, bring your friends and wear black. And eye protection. Yeah. And kind of, it's a fucking unpredictable scenario. So try to cool. keep that in mind. On that note. <laughs> anyway, whether or not you can, uh, we... <laughs> We want you to stay safe one way or another. There's multiple dangerous fucking things happening all over the goddamn place right now. So to all of our listeners, everyone out there, we want you to know that we do love you. We really, really want you to stay safe. Stay sane. Stay healthy. And stay the fuck away from me. Good night, everyone.